video games, why you love them or hate them, I'll assume if you're watching this video, you probably love them, have been a massive part of human history. Much like other forms of entertainment, such as books and movies, they've shaped how you think, act, and how you perceive things in the real world. Today we are going to take a ride in my time machine and look back at that history. Oh, um, probably not a good time to mention this, but this time machine is a, a, a one-way deal. I actually haven't figured out how to travel into the future yet. From 4000 BC to 1957, it was a slow time for video game history, because you know, due to not being any video games. Aww. I don't really know what people did in their spare time back then. Started wars, played with sticks, things like that. Then in 1958, some American guy with the most British sounding name I've ever heard in my life, William Higginbottom, decided, do you know what? I'm sick of playing with sticks, and so using the same creation engine that Bethesda still used to this day, he took a game that you play with sticks, and turned it into a video game. That game being Tennis for Two, in which two players would play a game of tennis against each other. Legend has it the first person to play this game claimed to be sleeping with his opponent's mother, and thus, the competitive multiplayer was born. Fast forward to 1972, and the first popular games companies created, Atari, with revolutionary games such as... It was another tennis game. But at least this time you had the choice of hating your friends, or if you like me and have no friends, playing by yourself and hating yourself. That sounds fun, right? 1976 comes along and with it comes one of the first true single player experiences, the game Tendal Games. It was a tennis game, apart from this time you broke bricks. Damn, people really liked tennis back in the 70s didn't they? I mean why didn't they just play tennis instead? Then something magical happened in the late 70s, some genius discovered that if we put all these games into an arcade, made them as hard as possible and put an emphasis on beating other players high scores, they could literally steal from children without any consequence and this is where video game microtransactions really began. Smash hits were released, such as Tennis Invaders, Tennis Roids and Tennis Man, each designed to eat as many quarters as possible in the shortest amount of time. This lasted until the mid 80s, when video game companies decided that instead of splitting their profits with arcades, they could just keep it all for themselves. A war broke out, a war that was so big it was like World War 2 times 100, so I guess you could call it World War 102. That war being between the two superpowers of the 80s and early 90s, Nintendo and Sega, who became the dominant forces in gaming following the video game crash of 1983, which saw the video game market drop from being worth 42 billion to 14 billion in only a couple of years. Both Nintendo and Sega survived due to long histories and weathered the storm. Sega released the SG-1000 and Nintendo released the NES both on the same day in 1983. Sega then released the Master System in 1985, so Nintendo responded with the Famicom a year later. Then Sega said F you and released the Mega Drive in 1988, and Nintendo said no, F you and released the SNES in 1990. It was around this time that Atari realised that they'd ran out of tennis games to make and made one big last hurrah to make a games console in 1993. Atari Gen 64 bit, 149 bucks. Releasing the Atari Jaguar made with real Jaguars, then the PlayStation released a year later. At this point in time, you could categorise a game into two categories, 2D or tennis, but a third option was emerging, people were starting to figure out how to make games in 3D. Sure, games before had already made the illusion they were in 3D, like Battlezone in 1980, which was 3D with 2D movement, but the true 3D era came in the 90s, with games such as Wolfenstein and Doom. But the truly defining 3D game, much like it defined the 2D era, was that little Italian plumber, Mario. With the release of Super Mario 64 in 1996, it came after the realisation that Italy was in fact in 3D, and people's plumbing was in 3D, which meant that Mario would be the perfect fit for 3D. Game companies went crazy with platformers in the 90s and early 2000s. Nintendo had games like Mario and Banjo-Kazooie, PlayStation had Crash Bandicoot and Spyro, Sega had Sonic, and Atari had International 3D Tennis. With 3D graphics came more realistic games and gave cans everywhere the ammunition to complain about how video game violence was turning their precious kids, who never did anything wrong and were descended by the angels themselves, into blue hedgehogs who'd run about the house for hours on end, disturbing Karen's daily bottle of wine, it was setting such a good example for our children. It's safe to say, games like Grand Theft Auto took the brunt of this criticism, which only heightened the game's popularity with the younger audience. Who would have thought that something adults hated would make kids want to play it more? Online PC gaming was also starting to become popular in the early 2000s, with MMOs like RuneScape and World of Warcraft hitting the scene in 2000 and 2004 respectively, causing many people to never lose their virginity. In 2005, we'd get one of the greatest moments in gaming history for World of Warcraft. Alright,
Oh my god, he just ran in. It would take consoles some time to catch up to the online capabilities of a PC. I just got into Xbox Live. I uh, have this really great high-speed connection, and I was playing one-on-one -on -one NFL Fever against some other players from around the country. Now my gamer tag, my uh, my online ID is Dark Master. I was masking my voice. Which meant the only way to experience these games was to try and do it for your parents' PC. It wasn't capable of running these games and playing with respectable 10 FPS. And if you had no money for a console and an unreliable PC, well good news, because in the early 2000s, flash games were starting to become a thing. Now if you wanted to play something that slightly resembled a game for hours on end, you could, straight from your web browser. 2000 was also an important year as it saw the first competitive esports scene emerge in South Korea. While other games had tele organised tournaments in the 90s, such as Street Fighter and other fighting games, and by organised, I mean 10 people hugged around the same screen in some local arcade drinking Mountain Dew. 2000 was the first time we've seen esports in an actual professional setting, with games like StarCraft and Warcraft 3 leading the way. By 2010, numerous international esports tournaments had been established across various game genres. Back to consoles, PlayStation had kicked ass over the 90s and early 2000s. Sorry for language cans, please don't report me. With PlayStation selling over 102 million units, Yes friends, I'm talking about this. And its big brother, the PlayStation 2, selling over 155 million units, pumping out classic after classic with games like Gran Turismo, Final Fantasy, Resident Evil, Grand Theft Auto, Tomb Raider, Tekken, Jack and Daxter, Rayman, Kingdom Hearts, God of War, Metal Gear. Nintendo managed to hang on to the PlayStation onslaught, released the Nintendo 64 and GameCube, which bolstered classic titles like Mario, Mario and Mario. Sega released the Saturn, which didn't do very well, so they came up with the genius idea of the Dreamcast, a pioneer of its time, providing internet support via its built-in modem for online play. It failed miserably and Sega never made a console again and basically became Nintendo's bitch. The thing Nintendo did dominate in was the handheld market. They released the Game Boy, the Game Boy Color, the Game Boy Advance, the Game Boy SP, the Nintendo DS. I mean, I myself played Pokemon over and over so many times, I still know the game off by heart. No one could touch them. Then PlayStation released the PlayStation Portable and Nintendo were like, oh come on, why won't these guys just get to fuck? There's an old saying, one in, one out, and that's exactly what happened with Sega, as they departed the console scene, a new player emerged, Xbox, backed by the powerhouse that is Bill Gates, I mean he even has Bill in his name, as in Dollar Bill, that just shows you how much money he has. Xbox released their first ever console, titled, The Xbox, I know, crazy, right? And they did it. Just one day after Nintendo released the GameCube, Nintendo was like, haha, what next? Are they going to release a handheld? <laughs> Please don't release a handheld. You're not releasing a handheld, right? Xbox done pretty well in terms of sales for a brand new console, selling over 24 million units and establishing its own IP with Halo and Fable. The thing it found difficult to crack was the lucrative Japanese market, with PlayStation and Nintendo both being companies from Japan, so they just called up their friends and were like, don't buy the Xbox, okay? And their friends were like, okay. But Xbox wasn't going to give up that easy. They released the Xbox 360 in 2005, which done really well and said take that PlayStation as they rode into the sun as a dominant. The PlayStation outsold the Xbox 360 by a million units. With games getting more expensive than your consoles, indie games started to rise in popularity due to them getting more exposure on Steam and PC and getting spots on console game stores. And they've been showing up the big developers ever since. I mean imagine actually making a really good game for a really fair price. It's unthinkable isn't it? As gamers start to trust these indie developers more, some of them have even to raise millions of dollars for the crowdfunding projects like Kickstarter. Meanwhile, as Xbox and PlayStation battled out over who had the best console, they forgot one important thing. Secretly, in an underground lab somewhere in Japan, Nintendo had organised the greatest minds in video game history to come for a console that was so gimmicky and so kid friendly that parents would be forced to buy it. The Wii was born, releasing 8 days after PlayStation 3, armed with so many copies of Wii Sports that people are still finding them under a sofa to this day. Go ahead and look under your sofa just now, I can guarantee there's at least two copies of Wii Sports under there. The Wii was a massive success, outselling both the PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360 with over 101 million units and making Nintendo the dominant force for the first time in 16 years. It was during this generation of consoles that a new way to game was forming in the shape of online gaming. Other consoles in the past did have online capabilities but no one had a clue it even existed and if you asked your parents about it they would tell you that one line is enough for you to become addicted and ruin your life. Playing console games with friends had always been popular, with thought of games having couch co-op, this new way meant you never had to leave the house again, recluses everywhere rejoiced, unless you were on Xbox, because they charged an extra fee for you to be able to play online. So this is why the PlayStation 3 sold the Xbox, 
Another way of gaming was also become popular in this time, mobile gaming, otherwise known as, no, I don't game. Mobile games had been a thing as far back as 1997 when Oculus classics such as Snake and their devices, but it wasn't until around 2007 that mobile games really took off with the launch of the Apple App Store. People loved it, with the store reaching 2 billion downloads by 2009. I always wondered why people ordered apples on an app. I mean, wouldn't it be easier and wouldn't they be fresher if you just walked to the store? At first, games were still in the premium model, a one-time purchase and the game was yours. You know, the way games should work. Then the dreaded free-to-play model was introduced in 2009. At first, games let you play for free, but the only way you could remove ads was by paying. Some games let you play a few levels for free before you had to pay. And finally, games started letting you buy things like extra lives and power-ups. Then it happened, someone discovered that if you sell someone a bunny outfit during Easter for 10 bucks, they'll be stupid enough to buy it. These microtransactions soon made their way to console games, although the first microtransaction was in 2006 before mobile games had popularised it, when Bethesda released Horse Armor and their game Oblivion for $2.50. Yes, Horse Armor. Paid DLC had been around since the 90s in the form of expansion packs, but these packs used add a lot of new gameplay to your game. However, this was the first time that a developer tried to add something that was essentially useless. I mean, come on. It's armour. For your horse. I mean, do I really need to see any more? Surprisingly, the player base reacted negatively, but when microtransactions started to become big on mobile, console games were quick to get in the action, and by the end of 2011, season passes started to appear, where you could commit your money monthly into a game. Because who needs a pension, right? Back to the handheld war front, a space Nintendo dominated since original Game Boy, with the latest DS system selling over 154 million units. Then released a new DS system in 2011, and this one was in 3D, and they called it Wait for that. 3DS. I know. Genius, right? It was, and sold over 75 million units. But PlayStation's handheld device, the PlayStation Portable, had also done really well, selling over 80 million units, so they tried it again. This time, with a device called the PlayStation Vita, and released it in the same year as the 3DS, showing no fear and going head to head with their rivals. It was a complete flop, commercially, and only sold 60 million units, although it did gather a cult following, so I guess it did have that going for it. Nintendo wasn't done just yet, with their newfound dominance, they'd be the first to release another new console and hit PlayStation and Xbox with both barrels. The Wii U, this baby was the first Nintendo console to show off HD graphics, <laughs> another gimmicky way to control a console with a top of the line Wii U gamepad and even had Wii in the name, there was absolutely no way it could fail, all Nintendo had to do was watch the money roll in. It was Nintendo's worst selling console of all time, selling so about one tenth of the amount of consoles the Wii sold. But fear not, because the PlayStation 4 and Xbox One were on their way just a year later. Unless you're Nintendo, then you should really fear. Nintendo wasn't the only ones fearing though, the general public were too, as Xbox announced that you had to have your Kinect connected to your console at all times, which was a camera that never even worked when you tried to play it with games anyway. Seriously, did these things even work properly? Rumours started to spread, Big Brother was watching us, the NSA were going to use it to spy on 14 year olds making memes in their room. It was end of privacy as we knew it. Safe to say, Xbox retracted their statement and made it so you could in fact play your Xbox without the government spying on you, but the damage had been done. Both the Xbox One and PlayStation 4 released in November of 2013 and the PlayStation outsold the Xbox by over double the amount of units. The Kinect may have not worked, but another form of looking like an idiot if your neighbours looked into a window was starting to become popular around the mid-2010s. Virtual reality gaming, which was like the Wii, apart from you couldn't see. If you want to walk into a wall or have a heart attack, this was the type of gaming for you. Virtual reality gaming has only been getting better and more popular over the years, and it's one of the most exciting things about gaming just now. Until Nintendo released some VR Carbon in 2018 and tried to charge 100 bucks for it. Speaking of Nintendo, the Comeback Kings returned in 2017 with a new console, and in other words, they just gave up on the Wii U and cut their losses. This time though, they came back for their ultimate attack. A console was both a console and a handheld, and they called it the Switch, and it even had a cool snap and clapping sound that probably sold about 10 million units on its own. The new console was armed with a host of Wii U games that no one had played before because they were on the Wii U. The Switch released in March of 2017 and was a huge success, selling over 107 million units to date. <laughs> this was probably helped during lockdown when everybody and their grand wanted a Switch. Just don't send your grand to buy a Switch or she'll come back for a late Switch. And the release of Animal Crossing in 2020, which everyone seemed to be playing during lockdown. Again, don't send your grand to get Animal Crossing unless you want to see patches run across the motorway. Then in 2018, we seen the first game to the unthinkable. Fortnite became the first game to unlock full crossplay between mobile, PC, and all major consoles. Now you could play with your friends and kick their ass with your keyboard and mouse whilst they tried to tap their phone screen with two bars of 3G connection. It was glorious. Pure thoughts in the streets every on celebration. Nowadays, crossplay is a common thing in a lot of online games, and to think it all started with a floss.
The flossing only lasted for two years though, because lockdown struck in 2020, and it just had come the same year that the world was waiting for the new PlayStation 5 and Xbox Series X and S to release. How selfish. Both consoles would come with the next generation of graphics that made you feel like you were in the game. Disc and digital versions, in case you're allergic to discs. <laughs> new controllers that rumble like an airplane, and more features that you probably never use in your lifetime. The only problem? You couldn't get one. <laughs> Chip shortages everywhere due to lockdown, factories shut down everywhere, and when they did reopen, social distancing measures led to delays, people were literally starving in the street because there was no chips to eat, and when they did release that at a time to stop the cravings, the scalpers were waiting. Bald people just wanting about stores, mindlessly trying to get their hands on the next gen consoles, which I appreciated because there was no hairdresser open at the time. PC gamers everywhere laughed with their Nvidia GeForce RTX graphic cards and so much RGB lighting they made the PlayStation 5 look like a PlayStation 1. Let's talk a bit about PC gaming. You're either a console gamer or you have too much money. There's no in between. PC gamers are the gods of the gaming world and literally rain fat stacks onto console gamers as they line up to buy their new consoles. But this wasn't always the case. In the 80s, the PC was marketed more towards a business computer that was better suited to spreadsheets and mud processing. You know, boring stuff like that. Then sometime in the early 90s, PC graphics overtook consoles and has remained there ever since. Since then, PCs have just got better and better and with things like Steam releasing in 2003, it has become easier and easier to give a game you want at the click of a mouse, making game discs not even needed anymore. In recent years, consoles have tried to follow this format by making games digital and starting streaming services like Xbox Game Pass and PlayStation Now. But it's took console players longer to adapt as they have a habit of wanting to put game box on a shelf and then never look at them again. It does look like things are going all digital though. We are truly in the future of gaming, which in a way does feel a bit depressing when you've been gaming since the 90s. But it could be a good thing as we try to move away from plastic packaging and waste. In recent years, we have also seen the rise of things like ray tracing and photorealistic graphics that means in the future, we probably won't be able to tell a game from real life. I mean, are we in a game right now? Who knows? The future is not came without its problems though. Greedy publishers, unfinished games and buggy messes. It used to be when a game shipped, it had to be in top condition because when it went out, it went out. But now, with the ability to patch games easily online after release, it feels like the norm for a game to never be finished. It's not all bad though, I mean at least Nintendo are still the dominant force in the handheld market and it looks like they'll remain there for some time. <laughs> thanks very much for watching, if you enjoyed the video why not check out some more of my content on the right side of your screen and thank you to my patrons Harry Haywood, Captain Tourette, Ash, Kajel Sinke, Sam Mumble, Zipnix and Zippy Lucky.